Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. My name is Ben Joseph. I'm a retired Vermont Superior Court judge. This is a program that uh, is on uh, Town Meeting TV once or twice a month. Uh, today, um, we're taping a show that deals with the, uh, the recent, um, what's it called, the economic report from the network. The Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault is an organization that supports the activities of, I think, uh, 15 uh, different local organizations which work in this area, trying to provide support and help to, uh, to victims. And I'm very fortunate today to have Jessica Barquist, who's the deputy director of the network, and Sarah Robinson, who's also a deputy director. I think, um, Jessica, you're in charge of uh, policy and organizing, is that right? That's right, yes, I'm the director of policy and organizing. Okay. And Sarah, you're just working all the time. Not all the time, but but yes, yes. I, I do many things. You're busy. Yeah. Okay. Well, the immediate reason for this this, this program today is that the network recently re re released um, an economic report, and um, it brought up a lot of things that uh, I think the public should be aware of. First of all, um, the scope of this problem. How many com complaints did uh, local organizations get in the last year for which we have a, a report? Can you help me with that? Sure, I can start there. So um, thank you so much, uh, Judge Joseph, for having us on. And you're absolutely right that our role is uh, statewide to support these 15 local organizations who provide direct services to victims of domestic and sexual violence across our state. And together, those 15 organizations serve every square mile, um, the state of Vermont, um, our largest towns and cities and the most rural regions of our state as well. And um, each of those programs offers a variety of support. So they, um, we have a 24 hour hotline that's available to victims and survivors. Also those programs help survivors navigate the legal system, housing needs, any other um, barriers to their safety that they may be navigating as they're um, seeking uh, healing and safety as a result of domestic or sexual violence. And your question's a great one. You know, last year in 2020, um, about 17,000 calls were made to our statewide hotline. People reaching out for help uh, related to domestic and sexual violence. And as we know, 2020 was a really interesting year. It was not, a, it was not your average year. Um, and so we are certainly under, still understanding in Vermont what the impact of the pandemic has been on victims of domestic and sexual violence. But overall, um, what we see over the past several years is that the number of people reaching out for help about domestic and sexual violence has stayed Around, approximately uh, even and grown some. And so we know that this continues to be a significant problem that many Vermonters are facing in their families and in their communities. Um, and we're happy to do our part to um, both support those survivors and work to prevent future acts of violence. And what is the cost of this? You, you, your, your original report talks about the economic impact, which I think could probably apply to several different areas of your work. but. What does it cost the state? Do you know approximately? Yeah, I can jump in here. So the economic impact report, we looked at what our public investment, our public expenditures are on domestic and sexual violence over the course of one year. And in Vermont, we found that that's about 111 million each year, um, which works out to roughly $177 per capita. And we were really intentional in trying to frame the conversation in this way. Um, if I could just back up a little bit and talk about how we got to this report. Um, you know, for, for many, many years, the, the movement to end violence has been doing really incredible work with victims and survivors. Um, and we know that, um, that we still have 17,000 calls coming into our hotline every year. Um, so this report was really a first step in us trying to do things a little bit differently to change the narrative around violence in the state. Um, you know, the kind of the, the 
old way of thinking is that is that it is bad people over there. And really what we know is that violence can impact anyone. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, your socioeconomic status. Um, violence is real and it's present in our communities. Um, and so we wanted to show a way um, to really change that narrative from an us versus them to a this is all of us. And this is a, a community problem that we all need to gather around. Um, so the economic impact report is really kind of our first step in, in that new way of thinking and that new way of trying to solve this problem um, so that we can make a violence-free future. And so we looked at, we looked at what it costs folks um, to really get a sense of, you know, what are we all investing in this every year? Well, when, I, when I, I think of the cost, I don't just think of the dollars and cents, you know, I, I think in dealing with these cases when I was on the bench, you know, often I would find that there had been some kind of violence in the home where children, young children, six, seven-year-old kids were witnesses to this violence. And I often thought that this is going to have ramifications uh, for the rest of their lives. It just, I remember I had a case in which, uh, a man had committed an anal sodomy on his own son. And uh, he, he came in to, to his credit and pled guilty. And when I got the pre-sentence report, I found out that he had been a victim of exactly the same kind of violence when he was a child. It's, it's just, uh, I mean, it's just horrifying to think of this stuff. Just horrifying. What do you, what do you, what, what, what kind of support do you provide to, uh, to people who call up and asking for help? So it's such a such a good question, and I will just um, note that you know the impact that domestic and sexual violence have on children are clearly um, pervasive and uh, significant. And you know now we know so much more about the way that when children either experience violence themselves or witness violence, those experiences stay with them and have consequences for the rest of their lives. You know, there's been some great research that's been done over the past few years that um, some of your viewers may have heard of um, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and it's a way of actually looking at the things that uh, many of us or anyone experiences in their childhood and understanding how those events have impacts on their health for the rest of their lives. So when we're talking about the cost of domestic and sexual violence, I think you're so right, Judge, that um, it part of it is the dollars and cents of today. When we think about law enforcement response, we think about incarceration, we think about our child protective services, um, all those pieces are, are part of the puzzle. And we haven't even started to really calculate what the long-term impacts are. So um, the fact that people who experience violence as children um, have adverse health outcomes when they're in adulthood. Um, or as you said, these sometimes generational um, impacts that happen as a result of violence and the impact that that has on families and on our entire community. And so um, we, we really are just starting to quantify what this problem looks like. Um, and Jessica can speak a little bit to the actual dollars and cents um, of the report and, and what we found on a yearly basis. Well, Jessica, it's, the floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like Sarah said, there are so many costs that we could not calculate as part of this report, including the, um, you know, the personal financial costs to victims as well. Um, but what we did is we broke down the cost findings into um, five different sectors where we know that victims get services or support. Um, so healthcare, we found that about $35 million is spent on healthcare for victims. Another 12 million is victim services, which would be those um, 15 member organizations that we talked about that serve every county in Vermont and provide advocacy and support to victims of domestic and sexual violence. And then the vast majority of the spending is in our corrections, law enforcement, and judiciary. Um, corrections alone is about $58 million a year. 
And there was one piece of the pie, um, Judge Ben, that you have talked about is our, our children and how our children are impacted in this. And that was something um, that we really weren't able to find out um, because the data doesn't really exist in our state. So we attempted to look at um, our Department for Children and Family Services data around how many um, cases of substantiated child sexual abuse there are or abuse as a result of domestic violence in the home. And while we could get numbers for how many cases there are yearly, we weren't able um, to get a, a dollar figure for that because that's not something the state tracks. So we know um, that there's likely millions of dollars in spending um, every year by our Department of Children and Families that we just weren't able to calculate in this report. Um, and you know, I think your point, Judge Ben, is a really good one in that um, these Im impacts on children are significant and they're lifelong. Um, and it's not something that I think we've really been paying attention to as a state. Well, um, I, I hope that, uh, well, one of the reasons I was anxious to have you on to talk about this today is I want there to be more public knowledge, more understanding of what the consequences of this are. Um, when you deal with victims, do you help them get, um, get lawyers or get what kind of supports do you offer them? Such a great question. So the first thing I would say is that we offer um, and try to connect survivors with the su whatever supports they need. And one of the things about domestic and sexual violence is that everyone's situation is different. So there are some, some people um, who are really interested in understanding what their legal options are and whether or not it um, makes sense or the advantages or disadvantages to um, reporting that violence to moving forward through the criminal justice system. There are other people that are really not at all interested in those types of approaches, but may have challenges related to their housing. They might have employment impacts of the violence. They may have had to leave a job or, um, or have to uh, add additional employment um, to support their families. There also might be people who have experienced, a lot of people that experience both domestic and sexual violence have major economic impacts to their own personal finances. Um, and they might need uh, support with credit repair, things like that. And so all of those uh, services are things that our member organizations seek to provide to survivors. We do also out of our office operate a small legal clinic and we provide direct representation to victims of domestic and sexual violence um, in specific cases. Uh, and when we are unable to provide that direct representation, we often are able to refer to lawyers who can provide that kind of representation, either low bono or pro bono. Um, and the, the, but the big thing I wanted to make sure that all of your viewers understand is that if they choose to reach out to a member organization, they can figure all of that out completely confidentially. So uh, for a lot of victims of domestic and sexual violence, A, sometimes people don't um, have been experiencing violence for a long time um, or are not sure what they whether what they experienced was violence or not. They're still trying to make sense of that experience. Um, and so one of the things that our advocates do is try to offer a confidential listening ear. Um, and so it is one of the great advantages to being able to reach out to our member organizations that individuals can rest assured that those con conversations are private, they're confidential, and that as survivors are thinking about their options, weighing their options, that there's someone there that can listen to them. Do you help people get uh, re relief from abuse orders? Another great question. Um, so relief from abuse. I'm on a roll here with great You questions. are. Thank you, you are. very much, yes. Um, oh, relief from, from abuse orders are a really common tool that survivors use to create safety. So um, a lot of people might know them as protection orders or some in some states they're called restraining orders. Um, so you don't have to report your the violence that you experience to the police in order to seek a protection order. It's you know a, a civil court order that you can seek directly from the court. 
Um, and we do our programs. Absolutely. That is one of the major things that we do is assist people in seeking one of those orders. They can be sought, um, you know, in a planned manner during the week, but they're also available 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the court. So if somebody needs to seek an order in the middle of the night or on the weekend, they're also able to do that. And it involves a survivor filling out some information about what they've experienced. Um, and then that paperwork goes directly to a judge and a judge makes a determination about whether abuse has occurred and whether there is a risk of, of future abuse. Um, and we know that for many survivors that those protection orders are really uh, important and effective tool. What can a pro protection order provide for? So many things, um, there are conditions in a protection order. So one, if a judge decides to grant it, the judge will also lay out several conditions for the person who's causing the violence. Um, and there are some conditions that are more common than others, um, but those are, judges really tailor each of those conditions to the circumstances that they see um, and essentially the story that they read about in the paperwork. Um, so that can include things like no contact orders. So someone not being able to verbally harass you, call you, incessantly text, things like that can be what we call stay away or distance orders where they say you have to stay a certain distance from somebody. Protection orders can also involve um, individuals needing to move out of, temporarily at least move out of a certain location it can include issues related to child custody. And really importantly, it can also include issues related to access to weapons. Um, so we know that in Vermont, there is this uh, connection between firearms and domestic violence homicide and that firearms um, do increase the risk of somebody unfortunately getting killed from domestic violence um, if there are firearms present in a violent home. And so a protection order can also offer some protections around an individual not being able to possess or purchase uh, firearms during a, a short amount of, a fixed amount of time, I should say. Well, it, it, <clears throat> I, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you, the, the, the people who come in and, and seek your help, is there some percentage of them that are contemplating suicide? Uh, I would say that there, there are some really interesting connections between um, domestic and sexual violence and mental health and suicide generally. Um, and that shows up in a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, interestingly, uh, for a long time in Vermont, we have had what's called the Vermont Fatality Review Commission. And so we actually look at deaths that result from domestic violence. And for many, that um, body has existed for a few decades, but it's only been the past few years that that body started to look at the role that suicides play in deaths resulting from domestic violence. So um, we're just kind of trying to uncover that and understand a little bit more about it. But what I will say is that um, it, there's kind of two sides, two sides to the coin. One is that undoubtedly domestic and sexual violence cause um, our trauma experiences for many people. And they can cause long time and long term impacts on uh, mental health. And at the same token, one of the things that I love most about my job is the incredible resilience that um, many of the survivors that we work for display. And so there are people who have difficult experiences in your life. And I would say that the most common story is of people um, overcoming adversity and of finding meaning in what they have experienced and um, being able to build really to heal from that and being able to build new lives. Um, and so it, uh, both exist um, at the same time and everybody's journey is really different. Well, you know, they used to say in the law when I was in law school that every case is unique to its facts. And I'm sure that every case is unique to its facts and the, the kinds of things you deal with, which is one of the reasons you need the resources because you really have to understand 
in effect, to investigate and evaluate the facts of each case. And this requires time, and therefore it requires resources, money. A lot of this comes down to money and whether or not the legislature can uh, come up with the money or you can raise it through donations or do you raise a lot of money through uh, donations from other sources other than government? Um, it, uh, it's certainly something that we're working on, um, you know, for a long time, I would say that you're absolutely right, that our uh, services have primarily been funded through state and federal dollars. But we, what we absolutely know is that that is not something that we can um, always count on. And that at the end of the day, survivors need to be able to count on services being available in communities. And so we really rely on a mix of funding from individuals, from um, private foundations, from um, uh, certainly the legislature and state government and from the federal government in order to really create the services that are um, needed by survivors. And what services do you think need the most support now? Jessica, I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about prevention. That's what I was just going to do. Yeah. So, you know, we have um, funding, state funding, federal funding for our victim services and the supports that we provide. Um, but I think the one place where we really want to shed some light and highlight um, is on prevention. And here in Vermont, um, we don't have any dedicated state funding for prevention work. Um, and that is something that we're definitely trying to highlight with this report and um, our new campaign, Uplift Vermont. Um, in this new reframing of how we're talking about violence, we are imagining a world where um, where we can interrupt this violence before it begins, where we don't have to accept that this violence and its associated costs are inevitable for our communities. Um, and to do that, we really need to think upstream and we need to focus more on prevention. Um, so that is something that we, you know, our member programs, um, all 15 of them are providing prevention services um, through other funding sources. Um, but really finding a sustainable state funding source for that is going to be a priority of ours in the next few years. Well, what, what can the organizations do to prevent violence? What is the prevention? What, 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 where does the prevention come in? That we could talk for the whole rest of the hour. On well, for you, sure. you, you've got six minutes, so go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I mean, our, our programs are already doing really amazing prevention work. They're in our schools, they're talking with children about what healthy relationships look like, the, what consent means. Um, they are doing really foundational work. And I think that is really important. And there's a bigger picture around primary prevention um, that doesn't get talked about as much. And that is making sure everyone has the resources they need to thrive. So um, Sarah and I are two members of our policy team, but we also work with our, our other colleague, Kara, who's our director of economic empowerment. Um, and so making sure that people have access to the things they need, like housing, um, you know, mental health services, things that provide, um, that kind of reduce the stress and the strain on our communities is really essential in our in primary prevention. Well, I take it that one of the problems of many of these victims face is that they're economically dependent on their abuser. And then one of the things that makes them loath to come in even to complain about this is the thought that um, they won't have housing and support for their children. And they, you, that's, that's a big, that's a tall order. You are ab absolutely correct. And one of the things that um, we know is that violence, it disrupts people's lives in all kinds of ways. Um, and that there is a really important relationship um, it's between poverty and domestic and sexual violence. And it's, it is not, um, I think there's a myth that, um, poverty is somehow a precondition for domestic and sexual violence, and that is not the case at all. In fact, domestic and sexual violence cause poverty um, in so many ways and for so many victims and survivors. And so um, economic instability and ensuring that 
survivors have um, consistent, reliable um, sources of income and housing is such a huge issue for so many survivors. Um, but that, that is really a key piece to um, both addressing and preventing domestic and sexual violence. I would also say that, um, you know, back to where Jessica started off with the report a little bit, there is something to be said of, in terms of prevention around um, us understanding that people in our lives experience domestic and sexual violence. So I would bet that almost every one of your viewers um, either knows of someone who has experienced domestic or sexual violence, or if they haven't shared that with them, um, that is a reality for perhaps their neighbor or um, a fellow parent at their child's school or a colleague or a coworker or a friend. Um, and so one of the things that we're really trying to do is make sure that people know that, first of all, it's okay um, to have experienced domestic and sexual violence, that there's help available, um, and that for those of us that are lucky enough in our lives to have not personally experienced it, we are still impacted because our community members are, our family members are, the people that we know and love are. Um, and so we really all have a role in addressing this problem. Well, I think one of the most important things is that, is that a person who's a victim of this has someone to talk to who understands what the problems are and can tell them you know, what, what, what's available to them. If it's only just if it's just someone to talk to, I think that's extremely important. And this is one of the services that all of your organizations provide. Is that right, Jessica? And and and, and that's people, absolutely right. People have been trained so that they understand what to anticipate and they can provide help. I think it's a great thing that you're doing. Absolutely, and I think that's a great thing that every one of us can do in our communities is let the survivors in our lives know that we're here and we're available to them and that we support them. Well, um, I've, li I've limited these, these interviews to 30 minutes <clears throat> because I've, uh, I understand that people sometimes uh, don't have the time to go beyond that. But obviously we could talk uh, for another 30 minutes anytime you'd like. I want to thank you both for coming in. This is a this is a very very important subject, and I'm just afraid that um, it's not given the attention it might otherwise receive. So thank you again. Thank you all for for looking in. And if you see that uh, phone number on the uh, on the tape when you when you view the show, that's a number you can call to get support in your community. It's a very wonderful service because if you dial that number, the 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 uh, the, the organization that receives your phone call routes it to the local program for the county in which you live. It's really amazing. It's a real, this technology stuff is really great. So thank you once again for looking in. Thank you for Jessica and Sarah for your help. Thank and you, Judge Ben. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Jess. Bye all. Bye.